there. Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. You are listening to the Frugal Crafter podcast, blogcast. And with me, I have a very special guest. Marty Owens is a painter, art supply reviewer, and the artist behind OwingsArt.com. We've been YouTube friends for about a decade, and I am pleased to have him on the podcast. How are you doing, Marty? I'm doing really good. And you know what? My day just got like 180% better because I'm talking to you, Lindsay. This is this is great. Oh. I mean, it's like an old friend, actually. So it's, you know, pretty easy to talk. Oh, absolutely. I think that um, as YouTube creators, you kind of find your tribe early on and, um, yeah. and, and like we did and with um, like Steve Mitchell and Cinnamon Cooney yeah. and, you know, we all just kind yeah. of like got in at the same time and we just, um, we actually would hang out on Facebook. We have a little group that we would kind of bounce ideas off each other and, uh, and it was good to have somebody in your corner when it was the old wild west of YouTube back in the day. It was, it was and, and, and and we could spend a whole segment talking about that change over time. But yeah, it's, it was great. It'd be, you know, and to know you for all these years, right from the beginning and to see your channel grow and all of the following. And I mean, I can't tell you how many people have come to me and say, do, do you know Lindsay, the frugal crafter? And I'm, she does. She did a review about this thing. You did a review or, or are you doing a review about something she did a review for? And I, I was like, yeah, I, I actually know Lindsay pretty well and, and we're friends. Oh, that's great. You know, and, and people are always happy to hear about that and the relationships you build over time. But, you know, um, Lindsay, I was thinking about this the, the other day as you start to get older and you reflect, you know, a little bit about, I mean, it's been more than a decade, but here we are. Mm -hmm. We were like the pioneers in this space at that time. There weren't a ton of other people doing what we were doing at the time. It was interesting time to break into kind of the YouTube content creator and and that kind of influencer kind of space and see that develop over the years. Yeah, it was cool. And it was good to have those allies at the beginning. Absolutely. Because none of us were like, oh, we're going to go be famous on YouTube. We're just like, what's no. this button do? Oh, we can put a video up. And and I was, yeah. I had a blog at the time and I was like, I hate typing. With I never learned to type and I hate <laughs> typing with a passion. And I was like, man, if only I could just show people how to make this thing instead of having to type up all the information. And then I, so then I was thinking, oh, let me see if my, I can put videos on my blog and that was going to cost money. And I am, I'm frugal, man. I'm not paying to put videos on my blog. So yeah, I'm exactly. like, where can I, where can I put video for free? And YouTube popped up and I yeah. never watched YouTube because it was pretty new. And yes. I'm like, okay, yeah. well, I'll try filming. I had this like little point and shoot camera that made me sound like I had a lisp and I just started recording videos and posting yes. them on YouTube and embedding them on my blog. And, um, oh yeah, I mean, we never had any idea that it would no. grow into anything other than just a hobby and something to do for fun. Mm -hmm. That, absolutely. And, you know, you were you were you were like a pioneer in that space and what, watching the ch your channel grow like, you know, how it has over the years has been like a singular joy of mine. I, I enjoy it. I often just like, you know, this about me, but I lurk on your channel. I'll watch the videos. I, I sometimes don't comment because I don't want you to have to look at an extra comment. But once in a while, you know, I will. Oh, because, yeah, that's real rough. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I just because you got so many, you know, I'll look in there and they'll be like, anyway, now that we're the OGs of, you know, YouTube, where it came, where it started and where the we are senior now. senior citizens of YouTube. <laughs> right, right. It's like, it's it's just weird to think that, you know, in, in any way, shape or form. But yeah, I totally identify with what you said about how you started and why you started, because you know, like I just went out to find out about a pencil or something like that in the beginning, like I wonder if YouTube has anything about this particular art supply I'm using and I couldn't find anything. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to make something and put it out there. And, you know, I like you came from broadcasting. So I thought, yeah, well, and I used an old crappy camera just like you did. And it, it was bad. And, you know, but people enjoyed what content there was at the time. And, you know, you, you look, I, I mean, you, you look down and it's like, 30,000 people watch that video. It's like, well, it's just about how to sharpen a pencil, you know? And um, it'd be surprised that, you know, I, well, at least I think the normal person would be surprised that people would be interested in that, but they, they sure were. And, and in your case, it, yeah. it hasn't, it hasn't stopped. It just keeps growing. 
Well, you're still posting consistently, and I watch every upload that you post because it's always really rich information. Um, oh, I was looking you. back at your oldest videos, and I saw your first review for a Gorilla uh, Pashad box, and I right. thought, oh, that was really neat. Yeah, <laughs> because you're going to spend some real money on a product like that. So you want to see how how does it go together? Is it easy to assemble? Oh. Um, what does somebody think that's actually used it for a while? And because now if you search any of these products, you're probably going to get um, a paid advertisement rather than yeah. a review. So when you've got those those special channels that do reviews that are authentic and honest, and I can count on one hand the amount of reviewers I will recommend to people to check out because we don't always agree. And I say, you should really get a second opinion before you spend this money. Even if I like right. it, if I don't like it, check it out from a few people. Um, yes see what they think because if you're if you paint more That's like smart. marty you're going to want to know what he has to say if you paint more like steve mitchell if you paint more like harry from the yeah. art gear guide you want to yeah. get their opinions too to see all the positives yes. and the negatives because they might find a yeah. negative that it just it didn't occur to me because i don't do that type of art and i might see a negative that doesn't occur to them because they don't do that type of That's art right. so yeah yeah. I, I think the more voices, the more authentic voices in this space, the better. And I feel like they're getting drowned out by um, the sales pitches. Yeah, that that's a lot of it now or, or, or embedded sponsorships in a video, you know, and, and and like one of the chief complaints I see about people who go to YouTube is like, um, and not to dive into this too deep, but it's why did I have to wait seven minutes to get to the thing that I wanted to know about this? Like, wh wh why couldn't we just jump in? And I think a lot of that for, for better or worse is because we, we made a decision early on by we, I say a collective group of us. And there seriously was a collect that we were going to apply some ethics to what we did. Like if somebody sent me a product, I was going to say, that's fine. You send it to me, but I'd rather buy it because then I'm going to complete, be completely unbiased. But if you send it, expect that I'm going to be unbiased. I wasn't going to take too much pat paid advertising or anything like that. But then, you know, over time you see YouTubers who have grown in popularity and actually they, they do some flexing about how much money they make because they've got all these paid, paid sponsorships. And, but I think there's still room in this world for like the honest, straightforward, you know, kind of no nonsense review of a product uh, related to our hobby which is art or our profession, which is art. And, and you do that. Steve does that. You know, there, there's a handful of us that do, as you mentioned, but I, I think it still matters. I, I really do. And I think once people mm -hmm. filter through all that noise and get down to, to finding folks like, like you and I on, on a, on a platform like this, they think to themselves, boy, I'm glad I didn't have to sift through all, you know, sift through 10 minutes of BS to get to your, to get, you know, get to the point about this product or get an honest review of it. A, a per, let's put it this way. It's a perspective on, on the product. And we try to be as honest and unfair and, and un, you know, unbiased as we can be. But I think, I think there was a commitment early on and maybe that was your broadcasting background for you. And maybe it was for me. I know for Steve, it was deeply rooted in his, his faith and, and how he feels about, you know, treating people. And he decided, Hey, I'm just going to, when I do a review, I'm just going to be straightforward and honest about it. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I think that the time when maybe when somebody joins YouTube, because I mean, there are talented creators joining at all times. And I, I definitely don't want to take anything away from that because um, they're creating Oh, in, uh, engaging, entertaining videos, but the algorithm definitely is going to push the more, um, the more, salacious the more entertaining the more engaging videos because i mean technically that should clicks. be what people are watching they're the clicks yeah. they're going to push the videos yeah. that get the clicks yeah. but um i do i definitely think that if you kind of maybe go down beyond the first couple of results on something and see uh, just a few varied viewpoints you're going to have a you'll get a better idea of what a what a product is about and yeah i i mean back in the day when i was in broadcasting you had to pass a test in order to broadcast you couldn't just um get on the airwaves and say whatever you wanted to say you had to uh, pass right. a code of ethics and you know you make sure there's certain things you're not going to say you can't run illegal con I, the amount of illegal lotteries i see on youtube and from small businesses it's like I, they don't think they're doing anything wrong and i mean i their intentions are probably innocent enough but it's like that's an illegal lottery you know it's just like different contests right. and giveaways that are that are run right. and then and then the scams that um 
Oh that I see goodness. popping up all over YouTube where like yes. you want to be people pretending to be you or I or whoever, whatever YouTube mm -hmm. creator and saying you want a prize, send me money for shipping. It's like, oh, please do. Yeah. No, I stopped doing giveaways yeah. because the, I was so afraid somebody was going to get taken advantage of and get tricked and send yeah. somebody money for shipping yeah. and end up clearing out their bank account, you know? So, um, yeah, the landscape has definitely changed on YouTube in the last 15 years. Well, it's um, it for Steve. I know. I know Steve Mitchell mentioned that to me a couple of times, Lindsay. That you know, he, he, he yeah, people run scam. It's just, it's a. Did you ever imagine back in the day when we started out that we'd have to think about protecting your brand, things like that, you know, or or or, or you know, watching out for that kind of scam, and um, or that it, we'd be yep. referring to ourselves as brands instead of yeah, like people because like, we're right. <laughs> Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and then of course I, you know, you, the more you're invested in it and the more you, you count on it and the more you sort of lean on it for like passive or active income, you're like, Oh geez, now I'm, now I feel I'm kind of tied to this. And you know, what, what, you know, huh. what are my options? It's kind of ensnares a lot of people. And I always, I just always felt like um, that that's a tough spot to be in for some folks, you know, and I can understand why some people put sort of the clickbaity titles in their, in their videos and stuff. And, and, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not perfect either. Like a couple of times I put like, am I too harsh on this product or whatever, you know, but not, you know, just to see if it would change the algorithm at all. And, you know, of course it does. And then you're like, Oh, you mm -hmm. get rewarded for kind of being a little bit controversial. And it's like, if you were really controversial, yeah. then you'd be like this person. But, but at the end of the day, I think it, it, it I just don't feel comfortable with that personally. Like I just, I don't want to be in that place where I, where I'm owned by either the algorithm or the, the, you know, the, the, the content uh, police or whatever you want to call it. You know, I just, I, mm -hmm. I just want to do like, I said, dude in Minnesota who wants to make reviews around pencils and paints and sketching. That's it. You know, not a big, you know, whatever happens, happens, you know, it's kind of always felt that way, but Right. So yeah. what, what is your favorite video to make? Is it a review or an art adventure or a tutorial? Yeah, that's a great, I thank you for asking me that question because I thought about that when I saw the questions, the list of questions, by the way, uh, br breaking the fourth wall here, you know, this, this doesn't <laughs> just happen magically. Lindsay actually prepares and sends you a list and you talk about things, but you'd never um, know it though. <laughs> you'd never know it. <laughs> We're very good. No. Um, uh, so the, the, can I just say that the videos that get watched the most are not always my favorite videos to make. So the videos that get watched the most are sort of the art supply vi videos, just generally centering around a particular brand. And this is, you know, not, not, a, you know, a state secret, but if you put on, you know, Faber Castell pit markers revisited or something, you know, in depth review, you know, that'll get a lot of likes and people come to it. And once you establish your brand as a reviewer, you sort of, you're typecast. And so people want to come to your channel and see, see those reviews. The ones I love doing the most, and I wish I was a better filmmaker, I'm trying to improve, uh, is storytelling and art combination, you know, kind of the travel, you know, art adventure videos. I posted so many and they get so few views because I'm, I'm not a great filmmaker and I'm not a great storyteller sometimes, but I think I'm trying to get better at that kind of, you know, improve that craft. Those are my favorite to make because it involves some of my great passions, like sketching on site, um, you know, travel. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the master of this, in my opinion, and even like accidentally the master of it is a guy like James Gurney or Steve Mitchell when he goes out on site and just does it. the quality of their work is so high and so good that you could record them on like an eight millimeter and it, that people would watch it just because it's so, so awesome. So it's not about the gear. It's not necessarily about any of that. It's about how the, the quality of the content and how well you can connect with the viewer. And, and you know, Lindsay, you know this about I me. Mean, I'm, I'm happy to always admit this to people, but very like at the height of when I was producing, you know, like two, three, four, five videos a week. And, you know, the, the, the clicks are rolling in and you're doing great. And at the end of the month, you're seeing that the revenue jump up on your YouTube channel. At the height of all that, a lady posted on my thing. I'll never forget it. She said, 
Marty, you do such great stuff. Whenever I have trouble falling asleep, I turn on one of your videos because you're like the NPR of YouTube, you know, art reviews. And I was, I, I didn't know how to take that at first. I was a little bit like, I don't, am I really, am I that boring, you know? And it's a, but, but I think what it, it, it was, he meant it nicely. And I it was just that mm. I'm just kind of plain in my delivery and, you know, just trying to, I just can't be amped up like the dude that's just hit like four lines of cocaine or so. I'm just, that's, that's not me, you know, I just, but the NPR thing, the NBR thing kind of got me thinking and I, I just embraced it. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Oh, I'm yeah. just going to be that I, character in my videos because it's me. I don't. Right. It's not a boring thing. What I think it is, is a comfort thing. And a lot of people turn to YouTube in these days for um, fellowship and comfort and friendship. We've lost so many third spaces in our, yes. in our world. Like I remember when I used to have my studio downtown and I would pop into a coffee shop and meet some friends, or I would just, you know, yes. pop into a restaurant, have lunch. And it used to be a lot more affordable to go into a coffee shop or into a restaurant and you can meet up with other people. And those places don't exist like they used to. If no. you go to a coffee shop, you're going to spend 10 bucks on a cup of coffee and and um, and maybe a drink, and there's not going to be enough places to sit. So you probably won't even be able to sit there and hang out with friends. There'll be people that are have their headphones on and working on their computers, on their laptops yeah. there. There's not that sense of community where you can just get together with your friends at a neutral place where people can come right. and go, where it's not going right. to cost you an arm and a leg anymore. And I think people's budgets are tighter now. So people turn to online communities to get that um that nourishment and youtube is one of those places where it's not just yeah. a 30 second real video it's not a tiktok it's not a um you know just a single photo you actually get to know the people who are yes. showing you the videos week after week and you form a bond and that's yeah. so i'm sure she's putting that on because your voice probably drowned out the worries that she might have about maybe her health or her finances or yeah. her job and it that's it's not a it's not a thing of being boring. It's a thing of, of being providing comfort to people. And um, I think that's I a, so. a reason why we really need to be careful of, of what we put out there into the world. We need to be ethical about what we, what we put out in the world yes. because yeah. so many people will take advantage of their communities and mm -hmm. just milk them for all their worth and not have their best interest at heart. And they'll just yeah. ride that wave as long as they can. And then they'll, you know, laugh all the way to the bank and they'll be done, you know, because they don't have that, so, they don't have that care back for their audience. So I would definitely take that as a compliment because yeah, uh, it was, I would say it was definitely intended that way. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And you say that. And I, I think about, you know, just in general, the exploitative nature of things, you know, like, you know, how that's, how that's glorified now in kind of our society, you know, like, you, you know, like the, the the people that are worshipped or 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 uh, you know, deified are the people who are who are the money makers and the wealthy people of the world, the people who can best cleverly exploit the other person. And I think you just have to make a decision about your humanity and who you are inside and whether or not your character is going to endure long term or not. I mean, I I know that's a very serious thing to say, but in life, in the final analysis that that's all you have. That's all you take with you is your character and no amount of money and no amount of other stuff can get that back for you once you lose it. And it's like, I just think about that sometimes when I see that kind of behavior in the community, you know, like that exploitative nature of that. So, and you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that it even has to be talked about in this context because, you know, somebody tuned into this for art supply stuff, but it's a reality of the world. And when you said, you know, people don't have that level of community the same way they did before. Geez, the pandemic made it worse, you know, like it, you know, forced everybody kind of in isolation. And this was a lifeline for so many mm -hmm. people. And for you and me, Lindsay, like personally lifelines, because we didn't have to stop making content because we'd always mm -hmm. kind of been indoors making content, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so that was a, a, a blessing for me, I think. And although I didn't create a lot of content over the pandemic, I sure consumed a lot. I mean, I dropped by your mm -hmm. channel. I dropped by Steve's channel, you know, the people I respect and know over the years. And as you mentioned before, I just want to make clear that there's a lot of great content creators coming up and, and, and new ones that are so I'm, I just look at that was so 
uh, kind of uh, humility and, and pride in my heart to see like people doing really well that are, you know, just starting out in YouTube and trying to do it the right way. And, well, you know, not to be too subjective, but the right way to me is like, you're not trying to, you know, manipulate or exploit others. You're just trying to provide kind of a service. And, and we do, you know, YouTube does remunerate us for, you know, being good content creators, you know, content's king. And yeah, I was just, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, that's funny you mentioned that because we, before this year or before the pandemic hit, the year before the pandemic hit, we were entering like our seventh or eight year, eighth year of the underground artist league, you know, where we'd all get together mm -hmm. at a coffee shop. I made some video. You saw those we'd sketch and draw mm -hmm. together and we had a community of people. I mean, eventually the cafes were like, you got to buy more than two drinks, dudes. Cause you've been here for like three hours, you know, or like we're sketching people, yeah. you know, but, um, but, and then the time flies when you're in that community and you're together. But, but once the pandemic hit and we didn't have that community, we kind of had to immediately adapt. And we did, we went to zoom calls to get together and we had a weekly, it's still going the zoom call for the St. Paul underground artist league, but cool. um, you know, just a small group of people wanting to get together. And it grew to be like, you know, now it's like 300 people, but you know, that you didn't ask me about this and I'm not, I don't want to surprise you, but I do want to say that we're going to release a book soon, which is a compilation of like oh, nice. 30 of the underground artists league members and, and their art. And it's because it's Minnesota, you know, and everybody knows us from Fargo, you know, cause geez, Hey, yeah. you know, we talk like that, you know, <laughs> uh, and here in Minnesota, but, uh, we're, we're, we're putting together the, th this book. And it's, we called it art and uh, recipes and art from the underground artist league. So it's interesting that people all put their recipes and art together in it. And that'll be, that'll be, we're going to, um, uh, you know, sell that you know, through blurb and stuff. So if you're into mm -hmm. books about art, it's going to be, it should be kind of cool and you can make food from it, but. Yeah. Thanks for letting me. Nice. We'll have to put a we'll have to put a link. No, that's absolutely great. We'll have to put a link in that when it's when it's available. Is it available for people to pledge or to buy it, yet? It, or it's not ready. It's not ready yet. But we're looking within thirty days. It'll be available. It'll be published. I know my local art store, Wet Paint, who you know about through my channel. Mm -hmm. We love them. They're the greatest little art store in the universe. Um, they're going to carry a number of the books, and you know, a few other places are going to carry the books. It's not about making money, though. It's tr just about getting the art out there in the public domain. So we're, you know, it's kind of like a nonprofit effort at this point. But, yeah, it'll be fun mm -hmm. to get that released and we'll send you a link for sure. Matter of fact, Lindsay, I will awesome. send you a copy. Yeah, you can have a copy. Oh, wow. I'll have to you share it on the channel. <laughs> so do you have any advice for people that might want to start a similar group in their area, like as far as uh, a meetup yeah. for artists? Yeah. Yeah, are they are where where are the kids now, um, Lindsay? Are they on TikTok or what? what what's the the new platform for the the kids? I don't know. Well, but the, we the kids in college, I think I think the kids in college are on Yik Yak. Have you heard Yik Yak? Of Yik -Yak? Okay, yeah, no, yeah, I think, but, I, but I think that's that's no. a weird one. That's like uh, I think that's some like um, I think they they kind of uh, that social media channel hovers around colleges and I believe it's also anonymous. So people like, oh, I think they just yeah. gossip on it. It sounds kind of horrible, but, uh, oh, but I think that's, yeah. but also if there's like a party going on, it's like, Hey, party going on here. So that's what yeah. Yik Yak, I think is pretty much used for, but yeah, yeah I think they're on TikTok. Yeah. Um, but if, but then again, but I think if somebody, my audience is, um, Mostly 80% women um, yes. between the ages of 34 and 65 plus. So right. they would probably be more likely to organize on Facebook or um, that's where we or did something it. like that, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's where we did it. But Discord, uh, TikTok, Facebook, any place you can connect and on a wide swath, you know, like, uh, it, but if you're starting a local group, usually, I mean, for me, it was just we I joined some local groups. So I, there was a Metro mm -hmm. Sketchers group and then the Urban Sketchers group. And then we decided those kind of groups maybe had a little bit more rules than we were you know, happy with. So like like for Urban Sketchers, if you join them, you have to sketch on site. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's nice to just take a picture and go to the studio and finish your sketch. And that's mm -hmm. not maybe not cool in the urban sketching world. And so they 
that they're pretty strict about that rule. So we thought, well, we, we kind of don't like that rule. So, <laughs> you know, sketch where you want to, you know, live and let live, yeah. all that stuff. So we just started getting together in a small group saying, hey, we don't have any rules. Come and join us. We're going to drink coffee and, you know, spill paint. And the people were like, heck, yeah, that sounds fun. And, you know, pretty soon there's like we're yeah. crowding into these places. So we had to go to like outdoor venues where it's, you know, like a park or something. So mm -hmm. anyway. I joined those groups to kind of get to know people, but you don't certainly don't have to. You just make a Facebook group, form it up uh, for locals and, you know, get together in your community. It's so important to connect with other. I've learned so much from other sketchers and artists and painters and, and things like that just by engaging in that community, the local community. You know, Lindsay, I like to tell hmm. an anecdote like it's um for you. For 19 years, I've been entering my art into the Minnesota State Fair, and for 19 years, I've been getting rejected. And I always, I'm always disappointed when I get the rejection email or letter saying, "Hey, you, you had nice art, but it didn't make it into the fair this year." And then, you know, I walk into the to the they have a State Fair art exhibit that goes on during the State Fair, and I walk in there, and I'm immediately reminded how awesome even the local talent is at like the state level in Minnesota, let alone the Midwest, let alone the East coast, West coast, you know, America, how much mm -hmm. talent is out there and how amazing it is. And I always think to myself, I don't feel as bad then because I see the talent mm -hmm. represented in the, in the state fair year after year. And it's always a, a lot, you know, it exceeds my expectations. I think about the, the broadness of our world and that's just the u.s then you expand out and you talk about people in europe and asia and it's like we're just little tiny tiny grains of sand in the universe you know it's like but i'm always so impressed yeah. by the the art even locally so you have so much to learn like like locally you know it's it's a baseball analogy you know play in the minor leagues as long as you can and if you get called up to the majors be ready when you get there but you may not mm -hmm. hit 350 or, you know, pitch 20, you know, win 20 games in the show. You know, you just you just work at your craft. And, you know, if you get somebody notices you out there and the big universe turns its, you know, turns its gaze on you. Hope, hopefully your character right. is ready for that moment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think it's so important to to try out those local groups if you're lucky enough to have mm -hmm. them. Um, I joined the the Plain Air Painters of Maine group. And of course it's all over oh. the state and it's a fairly large geographical area, but I found a few like paint outs to go, go with them. And yeah. uh, it's uh, different people every time. They're small groups because we're a small area, but yeah. it's so nice to see what other people are doing. And if you wanted a critique of something you could ask, but I think in general, people are supportive and welcoming. And there's also art societies in most, uh, most cities you might find like yeah. a, like we, there's a Bangor art society um, yeah. and you can jo join those groups. And I think, I think there may be a little bit of a stigma. Sometimes people are afraid to join because yeah. I think sometimes artists can be kind of shy and maybe even a little bit guarded and yeah. it may come off as being snobby, but I don't think it generally is snobby. I think it's more of a, just kind of no. like a, I'm going to keep my wall up until I know you're safe to, you know, to express myself to, because we're all kind of, uh, we're all, I, th I think a lot of us are kind of fragile and, you know, we might put up a good front <laughs> and then until we know this person's not going to attack us and then we'll, you know, well, you live in and, Maine for um, God's sake, Lindsay. Work. I mean, People imagine Maine as like the crust the of fishermen of artists? stoic, uh, like Maine, you know, like the uh, very, you know, like it's it's Maine, like we're we're not going to be your friend until you throw us two lobsters and, you know, like, uh, you know, some fishing line. But in reality, what you said, you know, like translates to me really well, because it, it on a couple levels, one is you've got this, first of all, the outdoor outdoor painters of Maine uh, uh, society that that sounds prestigious to me. It's like I might be put off. Like wow, these guys are probably you know like Andrew Wyeth. Like all these images pop into my head. Like you know what kind of artists am I gonna you know run into out there? Because Maine has such a rich, deep tradition of producing really great artists, and um, in the traditional sense too. But I mean not just impressionists, but even modern artists. So. It, it can be off-putting, I think, for people to think about. But like, I joined the the uh, the water the Minnesota Watercolor Society, and 
you know, it's, it's, you know, it's what you think it is. It's just a bunch of people who are interested in doing watercolor paintings and, and from a small, tiny little membership fee they charge every year, which I think is like minuscule 30 or 40 bucks. You get invited to like two shows a year. You can, you know, you get priority placement if they're going to just do a show or, you know, and for people starting out, if you want to get your art out there, that's a good way to do it. Kind of start out in the little local shows and the ah, local and I, society. Yeah. And there's something I think is really good for you to do as an artist is to go through that process of selecting artwork and matting it and framing it and or just framing it, depending yes. on the media and then hanging it and then going yeah. to a reception and just going yeah. through that entire process. Because uh, a lot of times we just share our art online and we don't bother doing that. And I'm sure there are a lot of younger artists that don't even aspire to do that. They're aspiring to be yeah. uh, TikTok famous or YouTube famous or um, Instagram right. famous. But there's something that's missing with that. And that is the actual um, community because I can get so wound up where it's like, I, I post something, I think it's really great. And then I'm just watching for a reaction. It's like, it's like I want I want the likes. I want the validation that I did a good thing. Yes. But these, I yes. mean, those likes, you tap a like in a second and you scroll on by and we're putting so much importance on people that have just scrolled by and hit a button, maybe left a comment, but you know, you're out of there. You're a wisp in the ether. You're out of their brain yes. like 10 seconds later. But when you go yes. to a show, someone's actually standing in front of your painting and looking yes. at it for maybe minutes even and like looking at an angle to see if they can see if there's texture and you know almost right. wanting to touch it you know just being close to it and you're seeing other people's artwork that are real people and that you can get to know yep. and it's just a richness that, that is hard to replicate on instagram 100%. and tiktok and youtube yeah, yeah so i i think it's i think it's wonderful and then the camaraderie of putting a show up with a bunch of other artists even if it's yeah. just you know at a, at a coffee shop or um someplace where you get a bunch of people together to to put your work together yeah. even if it's not like just your work it's other people's work too it yeah, yeah. it's nice to work together on a common goal it's something that's mm -hmm. positive for everybody something that people aren't trying to necessarily make money at i think it's just a it's usually an overall positive experience i think yeah i i i, I so, actually because those venues um amaze and humble me i'm oftentimes you know I'm in the financial negative in that, Lindsay, in that in that role, because I'm buying all the art that I see that I like, you know, I'm trying to buy it up because I like it so yeah. much. And, you know, it's it's nice. And now, you know, Susan, my wife is like, hey, you you filled the house with art now, you know, like you could stop buying stuff now. And I, and I just always find something I I like or, or you know, want to support um, a fellow artist mm -hmm. or somebody who's new or upcoming. And, you know, it's not always just about the quality of the piece, but. It, sometimes it's just in helping each other out and building that community. And, you know, th this, you know, I, I do these little tiny watercolors and sell them in the local gallery and, and, and I don't charge very much for them. And people are like, Hey, yeah, I, one guy said, I, I, I can collect your work, you know, and uh, put more in there. And I was like, so happy to hear that. But mm -hmm. I think that you mentioned this and it's kind of the democratization of, of, of work, you know, artwork, you know, is out there. Like if you think about TikTok and all these platforms that allow you Instagram to post your stuff, it's, there's so much more of it out there. And I don't know if mm -hmm. that equates to better art, but it definitely equates to us learning and being exposed to more art through those channels. And I, I like the idea of that. I think, I think it makes the world better place if we can have more art in it, you know, it, but it, uh, it 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 uh, it it does it washes the dust off our souls, you know. Yes, yeah, you know, so is that Picasso? Is a Picasso quote? Uh, no, who is that? So. Who said that? Was it Picasso? I think it is. I, yeah, yeah, I think it is Picasso. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it was. Fu yeah, that's funny. He gets quoted a lot. <laughs> yes, he does. Um, yeah, and something tangible like that an actual being able to buy a small watercolor because i think that there's a perception that only the wealthy can afford art and can enjoy right. that but when you can put something out there that's why i always love to do i don't charge a lot for my art and i always love to do the sidewalk art festival festivals because oh, when yeah. you have something that somebody like a kid can afford sometimes or i used to take up my failed paintings because i taught a lot of classes and i'd have like so many paintings and i'm like i'm never going to frame that that was just like a demo and i'll 
chop them up into bookmarks and just put them in a big bin for free. And to see a little oh, kid who didn't, who's been like, my parents been telling them no, 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 the whole time because the stuff's expensive. Yeah. They can they can take one and have it and take it home with them. And yeah, um, that's you know, cool. it's so that's it's so awful. sweet to see their their face light up plus i taught kids too so i mean it wasn't completely altruistic because if the parents you know liked my personality and like my artwork sure. then they might put their kid in my art classes but um yeah oh yeah, yeah it's, it's nice thing. to have a, a tangible a tangible thing um oh. all right so I, I i know everyone's going to be wanting to listen to you talk about art supplies because you are sure. the arts one of our favorite art supply reviewers <laughs> um sure <laughs> what product did, have you reviewed that surprised you the most either something that was way better than you thought it was going to be or way worse than you thought it was going to be. Yeah. I, I, I was pretty skeptical about Legion paper when I, when I first started doing something, because I, I really don't know where they source their paper. I just know that I ran it over. I put it through a car wash. I had a forklift drop thousands of pounds on it. I washed it in the washing machine and I brought it, brought it upstairs and I painted on it and it still was good. And so I, you know, I posted wow. that video. Yeah, it was like um, the paper needed counseling when we were done. But the paper was, I put it through all these really abusive tests, like way out of the ordinary. And the paper uh, was surprisingly resilient and and held up. Good. Don't, I'm not saying that all the sizing was still intact or anything like that. But, you know, I was able to paint on it after I abused it for about three days. So I... Um, I posted the video and then the guy from Legion paper called me. He said, Hey, I saw your video and can I ship you some paper? And I said, well, sh well, sure. You know, yeah, I've done the review now. So <laughs> sure. Ship me some paper. Yeah. And like, you know, a couple of days later, like a truck is backing up in our driveway, like dropping a pallet of paper off at my house. I'm like, Oh my. Wow. So I, I was pretty surprised. Not, I mean, the whole thing full circle was, was a surprise to me. The people's reaction to that video was a surprise. I, I wasn't trying to intentionally be too funny, but a little bit, you know, just add some humor mm. to a normal art review. But anyway, that paper was great and I still use it. Um, and it still works good. So it's Legion paper. It's usually their 100% cotton paper. And this was before, you know, before the real, there was a real, you know, when the perfect sketchbook, when Erwin, Erwin Lee, Erwin Lehan, released the perfect sketchbook and then Etcher took it over when he released that sketchbook. Mm -hmm. I think people were enamored with like, Hey, I don't care how bad my work is or how good it is. I want it in a 100% cotton paper. That's well sized, mm -hmm. you know, sketchbook. Yeah. And when that, that th th we were talking about cotton paper way before that, you know, like, so uh, it was mm -hmm. kind of like full circle, you know, and the, it was just, I, I love, I love that the ordinary person can use paper that's probably literally, Lindsay, going to last 250 years. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. not like alpha cellulose paper, which is going to, you know, deteriorate and crumble over time, you know, because it doesn't have right pH balance or it's too acidic. But I don't know. Maybe I'm getting too much in the weeds for people, but I just like that the kind of the the people demanded like better quality art supplies, better sketchbooks, better cotton paper that was reasonably priced. And then the market just kind of seemed to hear them. And, you know, before you knew it, Hanamule had released a cotton sketchbook, a hundred percent cotton sketchbook and others have, which, which is, I just think it's great. I just, I think that's cool that the community listened, mm -hmm. the, the manufacturers listened to the community and, right. You know, so that, that, that product surprised me, but there's been watercolors that surprised yeah. me from time. Like, Turner watercolors and mm -hmm. you know I'm like uh, wait a minute this this seems pretty good like I can like put a side by side next to Sennelier or some of the higher end watercolors or Daniel Smith or something and they, they look just as good now it might be shorter term because they're not single pigment or you know the they they well, they have more binder though. some are some are in the yeah. Turner line and, some are yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I like Turner's too. And there are, it's it's so funny to, because uh, I, I lurk on a lot of different Facebook groups and I don't comment very much because I don't, I don't want people to know I'm there. You know, I want to just kind of be a, <laughs> sure. be, a uh, be an observer. And um, 
And it's so funny to just see different people's reaction on different products. There was a set of brushes and I thought they were great. I still think they're great. And um, somebody was asking about the, um, because there's, you know, there's so many fly by night art supply companies out there now, and you can buy the same product from like 10 different companies for 10 different prices because they use the white labeling uh, they're the actually labeling. called fly by night art supplies now so yeah why are they <laughs> there's I'm calling they're them actually that. calling their companies <laughs> fly by night art supplies company now, so. no no i'm calling them that they're not calling them that they're calling them no, no i know but they're, they're they, fantastic. they've adopted the name yeah 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 it's it no they but it's should. true yeah, you're right. They should, but there was a set of, of quill brushes and I don't um I don't buy brushes with animal fur in them, uh like a sable right, or, right. or um squirrel. Sure. So I'm always looking for really uh thirsty brushes that are synthetic. And so I yeah. I've seen these advertised on Amazon and they were like a hundred bucks for these nine brushes. And I'm like, uh, but then on Prime Day they were like fifty bucks. So I'm like, oh, I grabbed it. They've been like they haven't gone back up to that hundred dollar price since then. I think they've dropped even ten dollars more. But anyway, I bought okay. the brushes. They were a set of nine by Grady. And then um uh the Paul Rubens company sent me some that looked that were identical. So it's like, oh, so this is a private label. Like this one company, I think it was probably superior making these these brushes as well. Oh, okay. And I really liked them. I thought they had they had really uh you could get a really wide wash, you get a fine point. I thought they were fantastic. And yeah. um I even did a quick um uh just written review of them because I knew I wanted to take a little more time with the video review, but I wanted to put it out there in case people were looking for information because I know some people mm. bought them on Prime Day and were waiting to watch to use them you know so they could return them if they didn't if they were waiting for the review they wanted to get the deal but they were going to wait for the review before they decided if they were going to keep them sure. and so i put them through their paces i used them i'm like these are great and so somebody was asking on a facebook group and i'm like well i've tried these i think they're wonderful and somebody else came back she's like i bought them i gave them away <laughs> i'm like really because i really like them she's like yeah but i couldn't stand them so it was, i don't know if that person was somebody who's used to using a sable um a sable quill but you Could know be experiences can vary or if maybe there was a little bit of a bias knowing that they were a cheaper brush yeah. knowing yeah. that like the sable equivalent would have been a couple hundred dollars just for one brush and yeah. they were predetermined to think it was junk before they even tried it or maybe they got yeah. a bad set i you know there's there's so Could many be. variables especially with products that are coming um and i have nothing against products that are coming from overseas but there's just less quality control if you're not making it yourself right. in your own your own factory then you don't 100 yeah. know what's what's what or what the customer is going to get if it's going from the factory to amazon without you putting hands and eyeballs on it mm -hmm. then you don't really know yeah what's no, you're happening. right so yeah i was i you know one thing you get to learn over time and you know it's not again not a state secret here but um there's like five or eight really good ford veneers left in the world you know these are the machines that produce high quality paper you know there's two in germany or three mm -hmm. one in england and there's maybe two in 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 italy and then there's you know one or two others in the world maybe one or two in the united states still um operational but these four draniers were were ba they're basically paper making machines you know the, the the paper recipe goes into a big vat and they pour it down on these you know felt pads and then it runs through the four draniers, all the circular drums and makes paper and depending on that recipe, it'll have a big impact on how that size. But if you're in this world long enough where you look at the papers and you 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 love the papers like I do, I love the paper. I love to feel the paper. I like to look at the paper. The paper is awesome. Um, you you get a connection to it, and you start like this paper looks like it came off the same forger near because they all have kind of a unique mm -hmm. signature, and depending on the recipe. And maybe I'm just blowing smoke and I don't really know that, but it sure feels like it. So sometimes the paper brands that are introduced by like a um, like Eastern European country, like there, there's a couple brands out there now that have started up. You, you you can tell whether or not they're using a European or an Asian forgeroneer, you know, a, 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 a machine or or. Mm -hmm. They may call it a forgeroneer, but it's not. It's really a modern machine that spits out paper. And the, it's not like the antique old timey forgeroneer that really high quality paper makers use, like in Hanemiel's case in Germany or, you know, um, well, Arches and some of these other, you know, mm -hmm. Fabriano in Italy. And they have different levels of paper, right? So now you're talking about mm -hmm. this is our high quality or our, 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 
our Lexus line and here's our Toyota line. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's a, it, there's different lines of paper and they might be manufactured. Different. But one thing is clear. There are still some really outstanding and reputable companies you can count on consistently time after time to produce quality goods. And yes, I always get questions about, but what, but, but this cost, you know, $3 more than I'm paying right now. And I say, if you, it's just like anything else in life, quality is never cheap and cheap is never quality. If you save for a little while and buy the better stuff, I know I'm talking to the frugal crafter right now, but in, in, in an instance where you're an individual person at home and you just want to practice a craft and you have the wherewithal to save a little bit longer and buy the more, the higher quality stuff, it, it it can make all the difference in the world to your experience with those supplies. And you know, right off the bat, Lindsay, you know the you know the ones I'm talking about. If I mention Faber Castell or Schmincke okay. or Schmincke or you know Arches or any of those companies, you can always expect pretty consistent and high quality from mm-hmm. them. Um, once in a while, when lightning strikes and you're the one who's really good at finding this, a boutique or new maker will come on the market and actually produce something really good for not a lot of money. And my first question is always, where do you source that? You know, is this a loss leader and where the price is going to go way up after this? You know, what is it? And sometimes yeah. the answer is is all those things. And sometimes it's not. It's just like they're making it as a passion and they don't mm-hmm. need 8% EBITDA every year over year. And they're not talking to their board of investors about how to trim costs and increase revenue. So, yeah. Yeah. Let's just, yeah. I find that, um, yeah, there, there are good quality products to, to be found for less money, but yeah. definitely if you want to buy it once and not take a gamble, sticking with something like arches or Han and mule and, exactly. and just maybe being mindful of the line that you're, that you're buying because I think people can get confused. Arches is pretty easy because they have their their just that one line of paper just in different surfaces. So right. you can't really go wrong buying arches, but you're going to pay a premium for it. But you probably won't waste any of it because you'll use it up. You're not going to, you know, but if you're of the mind where you're going to save it for best and not paint it all until you, on that paper until you get good, you might need to find something that's a little <laughs> bit more within your budget that you're not going to feel bad about just 100%. putting those brush miles in. So that's, that's where a, I think those uh, like, yeah, you're right. No, you know, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Yeah. I wanted to so, hear your that's where I think those those um those more affordable lines like Fabriano Studio, which is your twenty five percent cotton, and right. also there's different different sort of artists that need the paper for different purposes. If I'm teaching uh, like a free class at the library to children, right. I'll grab my Fabriano Studio twenty five percent cotton. That's not going to degrade over time. That's it's no. acid free. It's twenty five percent cotton. Um, the colors are going to be vibrant on it. We're not going to be spending ten hours because I think. The resilience of a paper has a lot to do with how long you're going to spend on the artwork and if you're going to be doing glazing and scrubbing and scraping and those more robust techniques that require a stronger paper for an hour-long class at the library, that Fabriano Studio (laughs) 25% is going to be – is going to work just just fine. Yes. Right. It would would it be more beautiful if I use Daniel Smith watercolors on Arches paper? Of course, because you could just splash that those products on that paper and it's gonna look good. But yeah, like right. as far as demonstrating yeah, but as far as demonstrating techniques, I can use Royal and Landical watercolor tube watercolors and give right. them all a little palette and I don't have to worry about anything going to waste because they can just paint and have fun. I'm not gonna be standing over them and go, oh no, don't do that. It's like you guys can yeah. just follow along, have fun or do your own thing and we're not gonna worry about what these supplies cost but if i was teaching um a group of adults that want to take like six weeks doing one watercolor painting you definitely want something that's going to hold up to that resilience so i think it's good that there's different levels and i don't think someone's necessarily making a bad choice if they choose to go with a more affordable or lighter weight paper and in fact a a woman uh, had asked me my advice for paper and she's a card maker and she wants to do backgrounds she wants to use brush o and she makes hundreds of cards and donates them to her church every year so she is going through the paper and she also wants to be able to stamp on it and die cut it so recommending arches you know cold press 140 pound it's not going to meet her needs and it's going to make things unnecessarily difficult for her i could recommend arches hot press 
but very expensive. But the yeah. Fabriano studio, this 25% cotton, their hot press, I like their hot press better than the cold press. And it's beautiful yeah. for stamping. It's beautiful for painting with oh, yeah. watercolor markers and watercolor, watercolors and watercolor pencils, which is what a card maker yeah. is more likely to do. They're not going to work in a ton of right. layers and it's going to go through their die cut machines without any problem. So that's a better paper for their use and it's cheaper too. So um, yeah, I think you got to know yourself. If you're going to buy the top of the line and be too afraid to use it, then that's probably not the best case because you might hoard it for so long. The sizing goes bad. You buy something a little cheaper that you're not afraid of, of using up and then treat yourself. You know, I do a, a paint to spend sometimes I've got my eyes. I don't know if you've used them. You could tell me how they are. I've got my eyes on, um, the Caran uh, oil pastels, they're Neo pastels, oh, yeah. but yes. I've got, I've got so many drawers of oil pastels. I'm like, I need to paint 10 paintings before I even think about buying those pastels. So I'll do like a paint <laughs> to spend challenge. Where it's like, I need to, I used to do it when I scrapbooked, I would do, I'm scrapbooking 10 yeah. pages before I buy another scrapbook oh, supply because it's oh, so, yeah. it's so tempting and it's easier to buy the supplies and use them. You kind of feel like you've done something when you buy the supplies, even though you haven't actually yeah, done anything yeah. except bought a supply. So yeah. yeah. I've always tell people this, you know, like mm -hmm. the humble, if it's mm -hmm. in the right, you know, I would be like, Hey, this is like the whole universe is open to me here. And I'm, you know, going to create today. But to your point, it doesn't have to be expensive to do art at the same time. If, if you're going to buy good quality art supplies and you're going to spend a bit of money, overcome the fear of ruining that stuff. I just, you know, so much of our lives is tied up in fear and, you know, being just worried about like going out and doing plein air painting because what if somebody sees it and it's really crappy and they're, they're going to judge me. No, people are going to judge people anyway, regardless. So, you know, it's your life. This is, there's only one, hmm. like, there's only one play and you're the character, you're the main character in it. And at the end of the day, just go out there, throw caution to the wind, uh, paint really bad paintings on really good quality stuff. If you want to go out, you know, mm -hmm. in front of a bunch of people that happen to pass by you and paint really, you know, stick figures, whatever you want to do, you're just not going to get, uh, it's, it's going to be very difficult. I should say to, to really get to the point in your craft where you feel completely confident in it. And you may never achieve that if you don't even try to get out there and overcome mm. those things. And so when people ask me about like plein air sketching and how, you know, what, what kind of worries and paranoias and anxieties did you have when you first went out there? It's, you know, I, and I'm trying to answer, honestly, I've just never been that person. And I know a lot of people deal with it, but I don't give an S I'm going out, you know, mm. I'm going to enjoy it and I'm going to be humble about it. And I just want to be, out there doing something. And even if it's bad, at least I've learned something at the end of the day, you know? And so if it's good supplies, bad supplies, cheap supplies, expenses, this is why I love talking to you because you and I can absolutely, and we have been before on the absolute opposite ends of the spectrum on this topic. You're, you're like, you don't need all that to do this. And I'm like, yeah, but wouldn't it be better if you had that, you know, and you and I have gone back and forth on a few things from time to time over the years. And I love that about you because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, Lindsay, I, I, you know, the single mom raising, you know, a bunch of kids, we grew up dirt poor. I'm not talking, I'm talking about government cheese, Lindsay, you know, like that kind of food stamps poor. We didn't have money for art supplies. So we had to make do with what we had crayons, you know, the old, you know, yellow construction paper, whatever was cheap at the time. And, you know, sometimes it would be, Mom would see it at the supermarket and go, hey, the construction paper's on sale. You know, we'll just buy a little bit of it for 25 cents for you guys mm -hmm. and you can go home in color. You don't have to have a lot of money to do what you love to do if you love to create and paint and do that stuff. So, yeah, I don't want to put people off by that. It's just the older I get, the more times I learn that lesson about everything from windows to concrete to cars to everything yeah. else. It's like, if I spend a few bucks more, it's probably going to last longer and make me happier. But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, it's where are you at on your journey in life? You know, it's like, well, can you afford what right. can you do? And, yeah. 
Right. And you might spend more time trying to get a lower quality material to um, bend to your will than you would if you just started off with a higher quality, kind of like like colored pencils. Um, I've got a yeah. class coming up yeah. for Derwent where I'm using a limited set, the, to the 10 of 12 Derwent Light Fast pencils because oh, they're sure. very expensive. And so you kind of want to know if you like them before you invest in a larger set. So I'm like, well, I'll just do I'll use what's in the set of 12. And when you have the higher quality materials, you can layer more. There's more pigment. And you're not filling up the tooth of your paper with wax, you know, before right. you even achieve the color that you want. Right. Um, so, yeah, then again, spending a little bit more money and having more colors, you would probably take the time it took you to create that and, and bring it back down to a, a shorter amount of time instead of an hour. It might have taken a half an hour or whatnot. But um, but, yeah, you can definitely use more expensive supplies, a smaller amount of them and, and get more bang for your buck. Um, and I, I wanted to circle back about what you said about going plein air painting and worrying about yeah. somebody judging you. And I think it's really important to um, to realize when somebody's judging you like that. First of all, I think most people that see somebody outside painting something are in awe. They're not even really looking at what you're right. painting. They're looking at them. Look at the magical artist that is creating something. Yeah. That's what's probably yes. on ninety percent of the people's minds. The ten percent of people that are judging you are they're judging themselves because they don't dare to do it, or maybe somebody shame to them when they were being creative as, as children and they right. felt embarrassed and so you know their right. their their instinct is to judge or mm -hmm. it, there's usually some sort of um some hurt or trauma that is that is coming yeah. behind those judgments those judgments that are uh that are being lobbed that way maybe they're going to judge you because they want to feel better about themselves they want to feel superior but i think yeah. generally oh, yeah. those kind of those more nasty feelings and nasty comments come from people that don't feel very good about themselves and that that's yeah. how they're acting out, I, I think, anyway. So, no, it's a uh, truism. What products? Yeah. 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 Oh, did you have more to add on that? I don't want to cut you off. No, I just, no, not much. But I, I, I do want to say this. You, you're, you're right. Like when you're, the times that I'm out there and little kids come up, they, they, it could be Rembrandt for all they care. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, I was painting a, a, a zebra at the, at the, at the local zoo here. It's a free zoo. It's, it's really nice. And a lot of kids go there and school kids and they bring, you know, field trips. And my friend Larry Ehrlich and I were out doing some plein air sketching and, you know, watercoloring. And uh, this these little kids came up and they were like, that's an awesome, uh, you know, that's an awesome zebra. And I go, it's supposed to be an elephant. And they just all laughed because they, you know, they could see the stripes. And I was just joking with them. They yeah. all laughed and they were like, ah, that's funny, you know. And a couple, a little girl came up to me and she said, hey, can can anybody come and paint here? And I said, I think I think Aww. anybody can come and paint here. If you, do you want to paint? And she said, oh, yes, I would like to paint, you know. And, and her mom came up Aww. to see what she was asking me. And, uh, and I said, you may have a little artist on your hands here. And, and she's interested in painting. And her mom said, Oh yeah, she does. I hang everything on the fridge. You know, she was like so proud of her kid. And just even that encounter with a kid like that or somebody else that you can influence and help encourage to, to get out there and, and do something, you know, plein air is, mm -hmm. it's, it's fun. You don't have to do great work. You just, you're just doing like kind of, you're, you're like, you're like a missionary for the arts, you know, you're out there and you're just trying mm -hmm. to spread the gospel about how great it is to be out there doing that. And I think people in general are, are thankful. So it's, it's, it's exactly what you said, Lindsay, if it's the 10%, you know, people that are judging you, it's, it's usually not on you. It's, it's, it's something going, going weird in their life. So good point. Yeah. 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 Probably just give them a hug when they say something. Negative. Yeah, I want to, but they're so they're, no, they're no, often no. yeah, they're often prickly. So I'm like, I'm afraid, you know. The, I want to reach back out and say, you know, what was your trauma? But, um, but yeah, I know most, you know, overwhelmingly that of the thousands of times I've been out sketching. Now, granted, I do a lot of it solo in the woods, so I got to discount about half that. But of all those times mm -hmm. I've been out, I can count like maybe once or twice where somebody came up and was kind of rude. And it usually isn't about the art. Mm -hmm. It was this, it, it, not intentionally. It's in, we're Minnesotans, so we're passive aggressive anyway. So they're like, oh, that looks nice. It doesn't look like the thing you're painting, but it looks mm -hmm. nice. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, I got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's mm -hmm. just, just fun here in the Midwest. But yeah, it's, it's, it's good. It's good to get out there and, and just be brave about it. Yeah. I was going to yeah. show you something. 
Can, you mentioned papers, oh, but I, gonna, I just want to, this isn't yep. a plug. I'm not endorsing them. I don't want to, you know, there's no reciprocal money. But like, like you said, there's fluid. Like I use this yep. fluid one and I use this little fluid paper. You know, I got it all upside mm -hmm. down, but these papers are awesome. And sometimes they're like it says here in the big circle, 100% cotton. But fluid makes a line that's not 100% cotton. That's perfectly yep. great. Yeah, and it's you've used mm -hmm. this stuff, right, Lindsay? Fluid paper. I like their. I like the fluid cotton uh, hot press. Um, I it's wasn't very as crazy nice. about. Yeah, I wasn't cra as crazy about the cold press um, student grade, the other fluid one that they had. But did it come up I, on you? So much... did... yeah, well, I don't know if it pilled. I just. Um, I think I didn't like that. That the the gimmick of the block being bound on both ends and being open in the middle. I feel like my, my paint was like oh. slooping underneath because yeah. like you're yeah. supposed to keep it attached like a block, but it's, it's eh. um, open on the sides and it was sliding underneath. And I'm thinking that the one, the fluid 100 was sealed all the way around maybe. And so I, I didn't see, have that I, issue. It, it shouldn't be a drunk test to get into your paper. You know, it just yeah. shouldn't, you know, like, I don't need, this is not part of a, a you know, <laughs> sobriety evaluation. I just mm -hmm. want to open it up and, and tear it off. And I've had that trouble sometimes with arches while I try to pull the paper out, you know, and the glue is so yep. in there that I'll rip the expensive arches and I'll be yeah. like, oh, that's a drag. That. Yeah, 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 that's a drag. But yeah. Oh, you, uh, you mentioned um, plein air painting. Yeah. Would you mind telling us what's in your sketching kit, what you bring out every day when you sure. go? Yeah, yeah. You know, I did a video about this. I have this lock B tool roll that my wife got me for Christmas, like mm -hmm. several years back. It just looks like a tool, like a regular old, like wrenches and, you know, screwdrivers and stuff like a tool roll. Mm -hmm. But instead, I've got pencils and brushes in there. And I will always bring my like watercolor kit. This is the watercolor kit I've had since I started watercolors back up after I failed at oil painting. But anyways, and I'll bring this Pentel water brush. Sometimes I'll bring a synthetic brush with me, like a like a mop brush. Like you, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. I like to really soak the water. And I'll bring like a bottle of, I'm sorry for all the environmentalists, but I still have a plastic water bottle. But, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll just fill that up with, with water from the house so that I have that. And then just a little cup mm -hmm. attached. And I bought, um, I bought Charlie Lee's Sketch Easel. That, that's a wooden, really nice sketch easel. He's a guy in Korea that makes sketch mm -hmm. easels. And, you know, there's a whole oh, nice. group of this out there with, you know, James Gurney's like sketch, homemade sketch easel yep. people. And they make them. Yeah, at, that's a group on Facebook. Scratch. Yeah. Yeah, they have a whole Facebook. But uh, to be honest with you, I, 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 I'm not so handy at little construction. Like I could do some stuff around the house, but I'm not like, why not pay him? Because he's the expert and it's, you know, spreading mm -hmm. the joy. And so I think I paid like, little under 200 bucks for it. It's like a, it's like a million dollar thing to me. Like, so I could take it out, put it on my tripod, set it up, stand, sit, whatever I want to do mm -hmm. and bring that up if I'm going to be camped someplace. But a lot of times, Lin Lindsay, I just bring my sketch book with me and that's my surface. And I'll just hold my hand open and sketch in it. You know, if it's something quick, I do. Um, I wanted to show you some, some just regular stuff. You don't have to spend a lot of money. There's a number, a little humble mm -hmm. uh, favor Castell, like that's just a, like a number, whatever that is there. This is a dark one. I think this is an 8B or some crazy thing, but and then mm -hmm. I just, just got these you mechanical pencil. pencils. Yeah, this one's a Karen Dosh. It's mm -hmm. a little bit more hoity-toity, you know, but it's a really <laughs> great one. And I have, a, you know, I, I, I taped it so I know that because I have a couple of these and I taped it so I know what lead is in there. This is a like a 2B. I was use I'm on the softer mm -hmm. side of the lead spectrum, so I'll use like four B, five B, six B rather than H B or H's. And then I mm -hmm. take like microns with me, you know, the little microns. You know, mm -hmm. everybody knows these pens. Because they're Waterproof permanent pens. ink. Yeah, permanent ink. Mm -hmm. And then uh I always try to carry a uh these UM fifty one, you know, these white pens. They're not gel pens. Yeah. They're the uniball, like they're so great and uh well, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, what the uniball the gel impact broad. Yep. Yeah, this is such an outstanding I just haven't found a better like white pen when I'm doing watercolor stuff and I wanna I don't want to yeah. use gouache, white gouache, but I just mm -hmm. want a little dot. I'll just use this mm -hmm. pen and it works good. Yeah. 
I, I highly uh, agree with that too. I find that I have really good luck with that pen, but I've also heard that people in more arid um, environments that they have a better luck with the jelly roll 10 um oh, size sure. 10 white gel I can see 10 that. and i don't yeah. i think it's i think it's an environmental thing because my jelly rolls tend to clog on me but i think minnesota and maine are very similar in um, yes. humidity and, yes. and climate cuz i don't have problems with the um with the uniball signal gel pen that you just showed i use that yeah. one all the time but people in more dry climate seem to have the opposite like the jelly rolls work good for them but the the uniballs yeah. don't so it's it's really interesting so yeah your your results might vary depending on where you live and just your personality yeah. like we've we've said we disagree on certain products and we can still yeah. get along <laughs> and oh, yeah, uh, yeah no check out other people's <laughs> yeah no holy wars when it comes to that because they're all in the end of the day they're they're good i have this like this is like a target pretzel jar that my kid had once and I was like, I'm going to stick all mm -hmm. my watercolor paints in. The These are all like tubes of different watercolor. There's like just a, you know, core. There's like uh, M. Graham. There's Schmenka. There's, mm -hmm. you know, a, a course Daniel Smith and then Holbein. And if I'm going out in to sketch, like I'll take um, may maybe I, it's the fall and I want to get like that nice French red ochre or something like that. I'll stick that tube in my kit and just... Um, put put it on one of the open spots on this. You know, I don't want a whole half pan of it, but I just want a little dip of it, you know, because if hmm. you get good paints, not not to go back to that topic again, but if you get good paints, a little goes a long way, you know? So it's like, it's it's yeah. good, good high quality stuff. And I don't know, is that Nemo or somebody like that? I don't know, but my kid put that sticker looks, on there. Looks like Nemo, I think. Whoa, it's been man. a long time since I watched a Disney movie. <laughs> Hey, well, yeah. whatever yeah is, i think but... investing in high quality investing in high quality watercolor is definitely good because it's so slow wearing if, especially if you dry it into pans and uh yeah yes. you don't you don't definitely don't have to buy all of the things do you um, use acrylic well, oh my goodness. paint Lindsay? Well, I occasionally I will use the golden open acrylics if I'm going to if I want to do a painting in acrylics sure. and I'll use um, because they act more like oil paint. They're slower drying. I will use acrylic paints for crafts and home decor projects and stuff. And, and oh. I'll use um, a variety of different brands like that's that's why on Langnickel there. I did some lessons oh. for their art instructor kits and their art instructor series. Um, so I tend to use regular acrylics more for like base either base coating or underpainting sure. on canvases. But if I'm going to do a, a straight acrylic, it'll be the golden open. Um, but I also tend to do a lot of rehab, like furniture rehab and stuff like that, where I'll use whatever yeah, brand or gel stuff. printing. I'll, I'll do gel printing with whatever brand because I'm not doing any fine art with my gel prints. I'm using them on greeting cards that might get pitched the next day after I send them for all I know. So I'm not going to worry about the uh, the longevity of those paints too much. Do you do well, you are, the, you are the crafter. So that covers yeah. a wide area of things, but yeah. can I, um, before we wrap up, can I just say, I, I want to, I want like a couple of minutes just to talk about another topic before we finish up, but let me know if you have any more questions or anything. Yeah, I I can... One more question and then I'll turn sure. it over to you for your, your end model hug. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I would love to know what product is exciting to you right now. What are you loving? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, oh boy, as an OG, I'm starting to be like a traditionalist, like get out of my yard, kids, you know, like, so I, I, you know, what's exciting to me lately has been like the introduction of that, that Hanamule 100% cotton sketchbook that I know came off a decent forger near. Yeah. Like, I, I don't want to sound like a paper snob because I'm not, or a paint snob. Like people, what, what are you, what are your two favorite watercolors in the world? And I'm always happy to tell people that's probably, Schmincke number one, you know, Daniel Smith number two, or somewhere in there, Sennelier, M. Graham. Uh, but when it when it comes to what's exciting in the market, I really like what they're doing with um, non-oil based or water soluble oil paints in a variety of different, you know, colors and configurations. I'm not so enamored with like the um, the 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 uh, geological based watercolor paints that they got like what is it called neotite or yeah so i just find that the pigment the separates permatech the, the the pigment separates yeah. from the binder really easy and you squeeze it out of the tube and all you get yeah. is like 
clear liquid. They they need mm-hmm. to get better at that. Yep. And they tell you, they warn you, like, you got to mix it. You got to do stuff. But it's so hard with tube paints to, like, know what the mixture is or sure. what was your intent here. So, you know, that's a, a product. Mm-hmm. But but I don't want to say that's not great because it is. I le- love that companies are experimenting with things. And you, you mentioned somebody you work with. And I just want to quick mention Derwent. For as old and traditional as that company is, I love that they push the envelope on pencils and colors and stuff like that once in a while. They'll just introduce something that has makes no monetary sense whatsoever. It's just like, why would you do why would you put the effort into that? Because you're never gonna recoup the cost, but they do it and bless their hearts for that because they do some crazy stuff once in a while, Derwent. And I'm just so enamored with companies that do that. Occasionally Faber-Castell will push the envelope. You know, these are traditional companies that are trying to like break through in markets or do something different. And some, oftentimes they have the money to experiment and do those different things, you know, Mm -hmm. but there are a lot of boutique places, you know, like um, young uh, companies that are up and coming or just individuals that are creating like their boutique line of a particular paint or something, you know, here are four Mm -hmm. limited palette paints that I made and I put into pans and, you know, I'm selling them as a boutique item or whatever. So Etsy is like one of my favorite spots to go for that kind of thing and just browse that stuff. And once in a while I'll, I'll pick something up, you know, because it's just cool to support that. And, but I think, you know, to your point, uh, you're probably a lot closer to like the to the product world than I am. I just, uh, Lindsay, you know, like I see stuff, I like it, I buy it, I test it. That's it. I don't, there's mm-hmm. no like science to my approach. Maybe there should be, but because people are always asking me, Lindsay, I don't know if they ask you this. So, hey, I saw a video from 12 years ago. How's the light test, fast test going on that thing that you <laughs> hung up in the window? I'm like, wait a minute, what video, you know, like, and so I'll go back and look and yeah, sure enough, I mentioned I was going to do a light test on it, <laughs> but I'll forget, you know, it's all in a folder somewhere, but now I've got so many mm-hmm. of them that I, you know, I had to go back and look and then post a response. But, um, but yeah, sometimes it, you can, we've been doing this so long, Lindsay, you know, what holds up and what doesn't look, look, look behind you, for instance, at your boy, I could pay my kids tuition with what you've got. If those are Copic markers, I can, Oh, like they're actually not all no. Okay, okay. If they There's were, a variety. Like, that's, There's a... that's a new car, Lindsay. It's so... No, there's a there's a variety. I have probably probably about a hundred of them are Copic, but um, their quality has had some shady issues the last couple of years. Um, but there's Windsor Newton, there's Pro Marker, there's Prismacolor, there's uh, Alta New. Alta New is surprisingly great with their markers wow. for a new company. They came out of the gate with reinkers, um, neoprene nibs like Copic has, good caps that don't dry right. out, a fine a fine and a brush as their combination instead of a chisel and a brush because they came out going we're going after the card makers we're going to give them what they want if artists like it great but we're going after our people we're not you know casting a wide net and trying to grab everybody and they really did did a great job on their (laughs) yeah they they did a great job with their markers because usually a company has to feel it out decide whether they're gonna they're gonna bless us with reinkers or replacement nibs they're like no we're gonna come out we're gonna give colors that people want we're gonna give them the nibs that they want and we're gonna give them reinkers right out of the gate and um they they have become my number one marker if you want to spend the money on a refillable marker, they're my they're my number one pick over Copic. Refillable. Over, There's the yeah, key. refillable. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And they're made in the well, they're the markers wouldn't obviously nobody's making markers in the USA, but they yeah. are a USA company anyway. So oh, yeah. Well, and I don't love everything you, they come out with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say oh, finish your point. No, I was gonna make it. Okay. So you you asked me earlier about a product that surprised me and I had to go back in my time machine in my mind, you know, because it's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, but but you know what product I really loved? And I'm sorry that um, I didn't mention them is the Windsor and Newton watercolor marker. Like I was completely mm-hmm. blown away by the quality of the watercolor pigment in the marker. And I was like, it was nothing, you know, like I wasn't that impressed, like making the lines, but the instant water touched that color it was so vibrant and so mm. uh, just, and, and I was, I, I, I wrote to Windsor and Newton. I said, are you putting brighteners in this stuff or not? And they said, no, no, we're not doing that. We can't give you the whole formula, 
but a lot of these mm. are single pigment, you know, formulas we we made specially for this. And I said, well, is it is it is it an ink based? You know, what, what's the what's the story here? You know, how are you getting these vibrant colors? And you know, they never kind of gave me a straight answer, but which makes me suspect maybe it was you know there's maybe something going on there, but it was really good stuff. Yeah, I think what the thing is with their markers uh, is that they're not using the, they're using pigments, but they're not using the bespoke pigments that you would typically see in some of those colors. So they're using colors that are more like your staining colors and the colors that would have a smaller pigment molecule to them so they can feed through the oh, felt nibs. Right, right. right. So if you oh, look at like deep, what, what's Lindsay. in a color. Yeah. If you look at the pigment information on the marker, which they provide, um, you can yeah. see that, oh, that, um, say it was um, burnt sienna or something, it's not right. going to be like your PBR7. It's going to be something that's got a smaller, um, yes. maybe like, yes. yeah, like maybe a, a laked color or something or quinacridone that they've mixed or something so it can feed through the marker. They had an innovation and I'm so sad, sorry they got rid of it. I never really um, I only bought a small pack to test them out, but they had a pigment based ethanol based marker. So it was like an alcohol marker that was pigment based. The pro marker? And are you talking about the pro marker? No, it was wasn't the pro marker. It was the okay. pro markers are still out, but this was called pigment marker. And it was, um, they oh, weren't calling it al okay. an alcohol marker, but it was the, the vehicle was ethanol like Copic markers okay. are. And, sure. um, but they were a little bit mm -hmm. opaque. They had like white blenders. You could blend stuff out with, they were a little bit thicker. Like the ink was thicker than like your typical alcohol marker because they had pigments in them and right, right. they I, I just think they never marketed them well because i think that that could have oh, been okay. such a wonderful product <laughs> for people that want to do long lasting marker art and i yeah. i bought a small pack i was using them i'm like oh i don't know i don't quite get it the price for what you're getting and and um there was a limited color rollout and then i saw lisa from lock refine art use them to do a painting oh, yeah. and i was like they should have hired her to do their marketing because I think she bought all the markers when they were on clearance at some store and she bought them for like pennies mm. on the dollar practically. And it was like, if only they had reached out to an artist like her or her, right. they could have had the marketing materials. They would have given people the why. Cause like, I couldn't kind of get the, what are these for? Who are these for? What's the point of this? Cause nobody was really doing art that it was intended to last without right. markers. They were using it for right. like print uh, uh, reproduction, fashion design, Story architectural board, work, stuff, stuff like that's that. not yeah, going to yeah. hang up. Yeah, uh, yeah comics, yeah. stuff like that. But it's like, man, if they got those in the right hands, I just felt like they gave up on them way too soon. But luckily, they didn't give up on the the watercolor markers. However, they did ship them over to China to be made now. So I did get a hand, I did get a hold of the new markers, and I compared them to the old markers. Um, other than damage on one of the markers, I didn't notice a huge difference between the quality. Um, so at least the quality stayed, the quality stayed good, but that's something I've been kind of like side-eyeing Windsor and Newton about because they've been, um, they've been releasing a lot of, they used to have pastels, like good pastels. I still have some and they were sold open stock with pigment information, good right. pigments, and they discontinued them. And then they came back with these sets of soft, artist soft pastels. And I use the word artist in quote, because right. if you're going to use the term artist to market a product, then it should be artist quality or professional quality. Um, yeah, yeah. And they're, you know, shipped right out of China, no pigment information, same with their oil pastels, same with their colored pencils. And I feel like they're kind of trading on their name a little bit now. They've have their student grade water colors made in China and their watercolor markers that are professional grade made in China. And it just, I just feel like they're, they're doing a disservice to their brand. You did know? they learn from I, the, I uh, before... did, did they learn from like the Prisma color model when they got sold to Newell Rubbermaid? Like I always, my dad as a graphic artist and designer, like he used, he loved Prisma. He swore by, and if you can find old new stock from mm -hmm. the seventies or early eighties before the sale, you're, those are great pencils, but the whole new yeah. era has been a disaster for that brand. You know, it's like, unfortunately, you know, they fired all of the, the, the people that were, you know, maybe higher paid, but were good at, you know, they, they ran, they, they built the brand. They were good at, you know, picking mm -hmm. the right colors and making high quality pencils. And there was some quality there, but yeah. You know, 
It, it's a it's a real shame because I got started on Prismacolor. My art teacher, I was lucky enough to have art lessons when I was a small child. And at, at age um, five, she was like, get her Prismacolor pencils. Don't bother with Crayola. Don't bother with anything. Get her Prismacolor. So I had a set of 60 Prismacolor pencils from, I don't know, it would have been the late 70s, early 80s. And they were great. So and I still far. have some stubs and the, the barrels are much thicker because yes. it's such soft lead that you need to protect the lead in the barrels. And yes. I think there's... I think the cores of the pencils are still the same cores, but they've skimped on the on the barrels so much and they're not always centered and so they break. Um they they're better than they were about 10 years ago, but they're yeah. still uh they're I still locked they in barrels and they, yeah, I, could, and I think I they're just kind of going it's a race to the bottom. They've cut they've cut yes. their factory costs by moving out of the USA and they've cut their um yeah. they've cut down on most of their lines. So instead of offering open stock on like their new pastels and their markers and their very thin pencils, they're just doing sets. So it's just yeah, I, I feel like they're just trying to to or it's a race to the bottom. They're just trying to get it as cheap as they can, sell as much as they can, and then I don't know if they really care this, about the, the brand because it's Rubbermaid that, this, that yeah, owns this it. This is what happens probably... when like a, a trash yeah. can commodity company or a rubber company buys your art supply mm -hmm. company. It's just not good. And I wish company. And I know it's hard. I'm not on the business side, so mm -hmm. I just look at a company like uh, in Tennessee, like Musgrave Pencils. Like I reviewed them. They're 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 still made here, and they're not perfect pencils. But they still make great mm. pencils. They, you know, their their Tennessee red pencils were I just delicious to use. You know, they were just awesome pencils. And I, you know, I love pencils. So anyway, you know, companies like that, maybe all of that downgrading has left room for them to kind of reemerge in the market as an American, you know, pencil maker, but with American labor and Amer you know, I'm 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 all in on America too, you know, Lindsay. And it's good that don't like Europeans, they make great stuff, but some of the cheap stuff that comes out of, you know, um, China and stuff, it's not only a question of labor practice, but, but the paper sourcing. And it's, I'm not so upset when companies are transparent about it, like when they're just plain transparent, mm -hmm. but like when a company as good as I think Etcher could be or is, like, you don't have to hide it. We, we know you're making your paper in China. It's okay. You can't sell that sketchbook for 40 bucks and make that paper on a Ford mm. in Milan, Italy. You know, mm -hmm. I, I understand that, but just be transparent. Just tell us where it's made, you know, don't hide it. And if we and ask, I think let that's, us know. yeah. And that should be just bare minimum. We should be able to see where the materials are sourced from. And you even yeah. see that on Amazon. Sometimes you cannot find where a product is coming from because sometimes nope. I'll be doing some, uh, I'll be doing a review and I'm like, oh, I wonder where their student grade line is being made. Cause I want to like, you know, I'm not going to say they, this company makes everything in the USA or this make, company makes everything in England. If right. they're, they're, kind of scooting some of their products under the under the wire and i'm not saying there's anything against products that are manufactured in these other countries because i there's a lot of chinese made products that are quite good the paul rubens products are beautiful um superior makes a lot of innovative watercolor palettes that are very affordable and that's a country out of china a uh, company out of china so i have nothing against them i hope that they are all using fair labor practices um obviously they're not paying their people as much as americans or canadians or europeans are getting paid but you know if they're if they're paying a standard of living or at least you know it, they're paying them basically it's not some sort of child or forced labor situation then yeah, i have no problem know because supporting. it's not transparent you know there's yeah. a you know that's what yeah, worries I... me sometimes it's just not like yeah anyway i i often wonder if my paper's being made in the same factory as 27 other things and nobody you know and and uh, mm -hmm. may, maybe it shouldn't be a big deal to me and for somebody who who can't afford it they they're like, I don't care where the paper is made. I just want to draw. I totally get that. I understand it. But, mm -hmm. but it, I did look, but, I, I did oh, look on the, oh, oh, the, uh, if you, if you go to the Bureau of, of Labor Statistics website, government website, yeah. you can see they have this, um this really long report and it tells you by country what products are uh, likely to be made with forced or child labor so that you can avoid specific because um, there, there seems to be specific types of products that are made with forced or child labor in these different countries. And that way you uh, can um, avoid these genre, these like categories of products if you want to be careful. Right. And so if you know that hair products and Christmas decorations and um, 
textiles that are made in China or Turkey tend to be, and I'm, I'm just saying this, I don't know, I, I'm not, I don't have the report in front of me. Um, so you don't quote me on that, but you can see that, okay, if, they, if I'm getting from them from this country, chances are they're forced labor, but if I buy them from yeah. Germany, chances are they're fine. Or if I yes. buy them from the United States or Canada yeah. or um, Brazil, or, you know, you can pick and choose that way and see where you spend your money for art supplies. If, if any art supplies or anything is coming up on those um, kind of watch lists, yeah. Because they still get in this country, they still get sold. Uh, so that's a great way to do some research and be, put your mind at ease, or maybe avoid certain products. Um, so if you want to know how the sausage is made, and you know, check out those, uh, check out that report. It's um, it's not a fun read, but it's 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 an yeah. easy read though. They put this together for the con for a consumer to be able to look at and and you understand and digest. So it's not just news. like yeah. Yeah, I don't know why, but you just go Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics. It's a government website, so I would okay. trust that it's, you know, been vetted. Sure. And sure. yeah, it's just, it's a long PDF. You can open it right up on your computer or your phone and you can read it all, or you can just skip to the country that you're thinking about buying a product from and see Makes if it's sense. on that list or not. It's very well organized. They had some graphic designers. Right. They had some UX, um, user experience professionals looking sure. that over to make sure, sure that an average person oh, that doesn't have answer. Oh, that's good. You just yeah, need to, you, got it. you know. You know that. Be yeah, educated. Yeah. yeah. Well, we should probably wrap this up. Uh, I sure. want to turn it over to you to say what you'd like to say to close it out. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I, I, well, first of all, going back to our long indirect friendship, you know, like I got a chance to shake hands with Steve uh, a couple of years ago when he came to visit wet paint and did a little demo and stuff like that. We created a video, which was really nice. I've always imagined that someday when I retire, I'll take a road trip, see you and James Gurney on the East Coast and some of my friends in other parts of the United States, and I'll get to shake your hand or give you a hug. But I want you to know, um, Lindsay, how proud I am of how much you've done since we first met and what your and what your channel has meant, not only to the community, but to me personally, our friendship. I I, I promise I wasn't getting too emotional, but um there's been times when I've called you out of the blue and asked you questions and you were so helpful to me right from the beginning, like anything from monetization to just art supplies in general and how, what a difference that made that you even took the time to, 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 to just want to share the knowledge with me and help me out when, when we were new. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I, I'm just so happy to see how far you've come and how many people have enjoyed you over the years. And you, you, Lindsay, you built a legacy. You built a brand. You, you, whenever you decide to walk away or hang it up, or maybe you never will, and you'll just do this forever till, till we're all old and gray. But um, whatever, whatever happens in those years to come, I just want to say to you, just personally, like you've made a difference. People's lives are Aww. actually better because of you and what you do as a YouTuber. And I, I don't heap that praise lightly. It, I mean, you got to, I'm, I'm the type of guy that, you know, I, I respect character above all else and you've got it in spades. And it's awesome to see, like you want to root for the good guy all the time in life. You know, it's like, like the underdog, the good, you just want to root. And once in a while, the good guy or gal makes it and and does well and that it means everything so think about Aww. how many little girls that you've inspired and and women who 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 want to do something but you know and and or basement dwelling you know watercolorists like myself but um you know inspired us to do something just cuz we picked up an art supply or a piece of paper, you know, or something you showed that made, made us want to get out there and create because the world is so much better when we create than when we destroy. So I, oh, I, that's I a just, quote right I'm there. In you. I'm just in awe Aww. of you and uh, I've always appreciated you and you know that. So I, otherwise I have to stop now. Otherwise my Midwestern like stoic behavior will just crumble and everybody will see right through the facade. But Oh, I do well, that's appreciate so very you. kind of you. I did not. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I know um, you did. We did you rehearse that. that part. So we definitely <laughs> did, didn't talk about that. So 
Sorry to surprise you, but I literally oh. Oh, oh, tell that's... people, go see your channel, go talk to, go watch Steve's channel, look at James Gurney, T.O. There's a bunch of people that we started out with that, that are still, you mentioned um, a couple of them earlier, and, you know, there's Angela and Fair. And some of them will be upcoming on the podcast too. Yeah. So. Hey, good, good segue. Yeah. You've got, you've got, you know, you and, and so just everything you're doing for the community and those people too. And you know, always remember that the character comes first and you've, you've got that. So that's awesome. Well, thank you so thanks much, for Marty. Having me. Well, thanks for having oh, me. Oh, my pleasure. Well, I'm going to put so a link to your YouTube channel yeah. and your website in the That's show good. notes and video description from so people can okay. find you. Uh, Marty just posted this yeah. wonderful video where uh, where you showed all of your sketchbooks from last year, yeah. and you did a sketchbook yeah. for every season, and you yes. interwove beautiful scenes from Minnesota in there, and uh, yeah. it's a it's beautiful, and oh. definitely hit your goal of a cinematic masterpiece on YouTube. YouTube because uh, uh, it feels like yeah. you're right there with you. Definitely. Oh, talking, cool. talking about Sarah Burns. Yeah. I was talking with Sarah Burns about the whole bringing people with you with all the, with the, with the oh. cinematography. Cause it's not something I do, but I'm in awe whenever I see people do it. And um, I think you definitely hit the mark with that video. Oh, and of course, so you, many you. reviews. You're welcome. Yeah. So uh, all those links will be to Marty's channel in the show notes. And when that cookbook comes out, we'll definitely make sure you hear about it. Um, yeah, yeah, and Marty, yeah. thank you so much for oh, joining me be today great. and being oh, on the anytime. podcast. Anytime. I've, oh. I I might have to ask you to reciprocate and come over. You know, Steve and you and I and Lockery Fine Arts and there was a couple other people. Yeah. We did like a mashup group together thing once years ago. <laughs> I always love it. Get that video has a lot of views. People love that. But someday I'd like to interview you for 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 the channel, or if I ever start up a a, a, um, a public consumption podcast and don't swear too much, I'll invite you on there. But yeah, thank thanks so much for having me, Lindsay. This has been great. Hey, to all the people that subscribe to your channel, um, and for all the content you produce for them. Um, spread the word, spread the word, let people know Lindsay's out there and she does what she does because she's got half a million subscribers now, but I could easily see that being 5 million in short order. So let's get going. <laughs> yeah, let's get going. Uh, yeah. Come on. Pick up the pace, people. Actually, go yeah. check out, go subscribe to Marty's channel. Check him out. Check out his reviews. Wow. Don't buy anything until you check out his reviews and check out a few reviews before you buy an art supplies to make sure that you really know what you're getting. And uh Everyone has different opinions. And also, I will say, check out the most recent reviews on whatever website you're purchasing from because sometimes quality changes. If you're looking at yes. a review from 10 years ago, things may not be the same. So, um, right. yeah, be, be smart consumers. Um, be happy crafters and painters. And let's just all make art and enjoy the time we have on this planet. Thanks again, Marty. It. Yep. Thank you all for watching, and uh, we will see you next time on the Frugal Crafter podcast. Bye.